Well, thank you. Uh, those were some, some very provocative and uh, outside the ordinary <laughs> presentations. And uh, I, I want to make as much time as possible for all of you to ask questions, but I, I thought I would just ask Willis if it would be okay, because you said, I think, what was maybe the most unusual statement up here. If you could just elaborate a little bit on the difference between uh, a temperature-based climate system and a sensitivity-based climate system. And then everybody else, please have at it. The, the key to understanding the emergent phenomena is that they emerge based on thresholds. Um, so below a certain temperature, combined with the, you know, the normal variation in the atmospheric temperature, below that temperature you don't get cumulus clouds, and above that temperature you do. The same thing is true about dust devils. You don't see them in the mornings. Why not? Because the ground is not warm enough. But notice that those thresholds are purely based on temperature. They have nothing to do with the forcing. The dust devils don't come out because the sun is strong. The dust devils appear whenever it's hot, when the surface is hot. It is not based on forcing in the slightest. It is entirely based on temperature. And as a result, this makes the entire system pretty um, unresponsive to forcing of any kind. I've demonstrated in my work on the web that the effect of volcanoes is much less than is popularly believed. Why? I would say because as soon as a volcano happens, we get obstruction in the stratosphere. Stratosphere warms because of the absorption of the incoming sunlight. The surface starts to cool. As soon as the surface starts to cool, the clouds form later in the day in the tropics. An hour later in the tropics, call it 400 watts per square meter, that's something like 16 watts on a 24-hour basis. Tropics is half the world, maybe uh, 30 to 30, so you might call it around 8 watts per square meter from an hour's difference in the time of emergence of the clouds. So what happens is if we have a volcano and we have a little bit cooler temperatures, we get an extra hour of sunshine in the tropics. Temperature warms back up. If we get extra CO2 and we get extra forcing, in general, the tropics will run a little bit warmer. And in response to that, the clouds will form a little bit earlier and balance it back out. And this is how the, the, the Earth stayed within one-tenth of one percent of its temperature over the entire 20th century because the forcings are basically immaterial. What counts is the temperature. It's a temperature-based system. Uh, Willis, I think in some of what you've written, you've talked not just about the temperature driving these emergent phenomena, but the f creation of essentially a temperature ceiling by the phenomena so that, such that you observe that temperature will not go above a certain range because of the phenomena. Does that help in some way as well to support what you're talking about? There's a curious uh, thing about the ocean, which is that nowhere on the planet do we get ocean temperatures much above 30 degrees centigrade. And um, I think myself that this is another example of what's going on, that the, the emergent phenomena emerge as and where it gets hot. It's not like a global thing that's happening, and that's one of the reasons that it's hard to study. Because if it's hot over here on the ocean and 20 miles away it's cool over there, we get clouds and thunderstorms on this part, but not on that part. So the pre they preferentially form, or only form, where it's hot. And so it makes it very difficult for the system to overheat anywhere. And I think that that is, a, is a, a, a portion of the reason, at least, that we don't see ocean temperatures much above 30 anywhere. Um, and it's also the reason that it, it is well, I've given an example before. Suppose we had a magic like a dust devil, except it picked up dirt, you know, in your house. And it would only appear where there was a pile of dirt. And it would get rid of it. 
be a lovely thing to have, right? Well, this is how thunderstorms work, for example. Wherever it's hot, they pick up the heat and get rid of it. But what that means is you can't analyze the system by looking at the relationship between the rate that dirt falls on the floor and the cleanliness of the floor. Wherever the dirt falls, you're going to get the little dust devil that picks up the dirt and takes it away. Wherever the system gets hotter, a dust devil will form there and take the heat up into the atmosphere. As a result, we, it, 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 particularly in the averages, it's very difficult to detect. Suppose that the, the temperature in the Pacific is doing something like this. When it's in the cool phase, we get a little extra clouds. Um, pardon me, we get a little less clouds, so it warms back up. When it's in the warm phase of that cycle, we get a little more clouds, so it cools back down. But over the month, if you average it out, there is no difference in the clouds. And that's why I've had to look at things like daily variations to be able to see the effects of this kind of control system. Uh, another question going to, uh, to, to Willis and the similar issue on this temperature controlled hypothesis. If, if that's right, uh, how, how do you work into it or explain ice ages or times in the past when temperature seems to have been three or five or six degrees warmer t than today? Well, I have to say the basic answer to that question is, heck, I don't know. <laughs> However, having said that, <laughs> Uh, there are several possibilities. First, anything that um, affects the overall albedo of the planet is going to have an effect, and the Milankovitch cycles appear to affect the overall all albedo of the Northern Hemisphere. It doesn't seem to happen other than when the Milankovitch um, celestial mechanics are proper that we get a buildup of ice in the Northern Hemisphere, and that affects the albedo. So anything that affects the overall albedo of the planet will have an effect. If the planet greens up and more of the planet gets covered with, with uh, uh, green plants, that could have an effect. Another thing that could cause slow drift in this kind of system is anything that affects the rate and amount and type of cloud formation. And the obvious candidate there is various kinds of aerosols. So um, aerosols can, can, can lead to changes in the, in the, in the physics of the, the uh, collection of the droplets around the cloud nuclei. So that's another possibility. But in general, nobody knows why the Ice Age, I mean the Little Ice Age happened. Nobody knows why we went into it. And nobody knows what changed to bring us out of it. There are theories, of course, theories abound in science, but we're short on information for that. It's continued to warm since then, basically, at half a degree per century or something. Why? Nobody knows. So that's truly the answer. Yeah. If, if I could add to, add to that, uh, you know, one thing is, is I'm, I'm looking at the astrophysical connections. Uh, you know, because the Earth is, is not just totally a closed system. I mean, we're receiving energy from the sun, and, 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 and part of it, is, as Don mentioned, the, the Milankovitch cycle, you know, but, but in fact, that's, that's, that's part of the precession of the Earth's rotational axis, you know, but then you've got the same thing about the, the, the Earth as, as it revolves about the sun, as the sun's moving within the, the galaxy, as other events are going on uh, in, in, in the galaxy, uh, a lot of these things are, are contributing, and even even just the alignment of Jupiter and Saturn when they when they when they align, we, we see, for example, uh, with 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 Jupiter's planetary system by itself that that the, the alignment of Europa, the, one of its moons, and and Jupiter with Io uh, are, are really causing tidal forces on the surface that are heating it, uh, resulting in in, in Volcanoes and geysers, and uh, you know, it's, it, it is a complex mechanism, and to, and to just look at simple answers is is probably being facetious. Um, by any chance, do you have anything to say about the incoming data from the IBEX mission and Svensmark's theories? Um, it, the, the basic theory that um, is being proposed is that 
uh, galactic cosmic rays affect the rates of cloud formation on the Earth. Um, and certainly, if that's the case, and the, and the essence of the control system is cloud-based, it could make a difference. I don't really know the answer to that, and it's made very difficult by the fact that we have not yet been able to find any sign of the 11-year sunspot cycle in, in climate records. There are many claims that, it, that, that, that those signals are there, but I've done extensive research on the question and have not found any. Now, it's known that the galactic cosmic rays vary with the sun uh, because they're magnetically driven on an 11-year cycle. And you would expect that if the galactic cosmic rays or any other aspect of solar activity was having an effect, we'd see it somewhere in the climate data. But I've looked at everything from long-term pressure records, temperature records, ocean temperature, ocean heat content, to, uh, atmospheric temperature records, air, rainfall records, everything I could look at. I can't find the 11-year signal. Now, it may be there, and I just haven't found it, but that's, that's where it stands for me. If I might make a quick comment on, on that, um, I totally agree with, with Willis. He's found very elegantly that there is no 11-year uh, cycle with respect to temperature in, in the record. However, if you looked at some of the cool periods that correspond to low sunspot cycles, low TSI, uh, cosmic ray uh, increase that I showed very briefly, all too briefly, I, I must admit, uh, you'll see that those are not regular. They're not on a recurring cycle, so they will not show up in any kind of cyclic analysis, and so, which opens the question, to which I don't know the answer, uh, there seems to be some kind of irregular, reoccurring um, system which uh, produces these results that we've seen. How that happens, we don't know. Uh, Don, a very um, clearly presented paper. My question is this. Is there any correlation between the number of decades that you project temperatures out in the future and the intensity of censure you receive from your University of Washington colleagues? <laughs> First of all, I might point out the University of Washington are not my colleagues. <laughs> and for, for which I'm eternally thankful. <laughs> But no. Yeah, one more question. Yeah, I've been looking at data a long time. I don't agree with at least half what is being said there. I don't believe the buoyancy that Willis says is that dominant. Over the, the thing that causes clouds, you need evaporation. You've got to get that, and that's due to basically the strength of the wind and uh, the air-sea temperature difference. And we see uh, over the oceans, where there's very little diurnal variation in the lapse rate, we see maximum cumulonimbus and rain in the late morning into the, uh, or, uh, pardon me, the early to late morning, and a minimum in the late afternoon and evening, and that can't be lapse rate driven. I think, uh, I think you've talked enough about the ocean circulations. There's great deep ocean circulations. In my view, that's the main thing that drives climate change. I think uh, cosmic rays, they may do something, but they're not dominant. I think aerosols may do something, they're not dominant. I think the solar effects may do something, but they're not dominant. The most dominant thing we have is the deep ocean circulation that can change on year to year, multi-decadal or multi-century, at least in this Holoce late Holocene period. And I just see things differently. I, I think too much has been made of solar, of cosmic rays, of aerosols, and all the other things. They're missing. And um, anyways, I just see it different. So, yep. so B B I'd like to have <laughs> Yeah, Bill, thank, thank you. I, uh, I, I carry my doubt, too, into. <laughs> well, we, 
you know, and I think that's even a necessary part of the scientific method, that, that, that scientists should be skeptical of new ideas until they've been proven by experiment. But I, I, I do agree with you, the, the tremendous effect of the ocean, and, that, and that's got to also be included as part of the model. I, I know when I've gone down to the Antarctic, I've done it a couple times, taken a ship down there. Uh, boy, when you cross that Drake Passage, and that's where the Atlantic and Pacific warm waters meet with the cold waters of the Antarctic, and wow, uh, even Sir Francis Drake didn't want to go there. Uh, it, it, it was wild, and there were more accidents there. Yeah, we're, we're seeing tremendous effects of, of the ocean. We've got to include the ocean, and, but, but we should not overlook, and, and I do think that we can answer those questions directly from some, some of the new satellite information from that A train of satellites that, that, that are up there now. We'll, we'll get the data, and then the IPCC can't deny it. <laughs> well, all I can say is this has been a fantastic panel, and if it had been my panel to organize, I would have had Bill Gray bat clean up, which he did anyway, so it was a it's perfect panel as far as I'm concerned. <laughs>